Welcome to Beyond Humanity, brought to you by Hive1.net. With us today is Matt Reddy, host of the Mindful Activist webcast, published author of Revolutionary Mindfulness and Hospital Commissioner in Jefferson County, Washington. He is an amateur ufologist, creator of Hive1.net, and a philosopher. I'm Margaret Howe, product manager of New Perspective LLC. In the Beyond Humanity podcast, we explore the possibilities and implications of artificial intelligence and alien life for human evolution, identity, and destiny. In later episodes, we'll have some time for the audience to speak to those who might have questions or have something related to talk about. We want to invite anyone on Earth, human, alien, reptilian, AI, interdimensional beings, and Met fans. We are sponsored by the Sisterhood of the Fork Tongue Worm. First off, we will start with Matt telling us about the Super Genius of the Week. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was going to prepare a Super Genius of the Week story. Um, well, it's going to be a multiple choice for you, Margaret. Okay. Uh, do you want a living Super Genius of the Week or a non- alive as far as we know like you know super genius of the week Ooh, let's do the not alive as far as we know excellent excellent that's it's hard they it's more less likely to get you know complaints from them <laughs> if you do that <sighs> super genius of the week mm. yeah i i didn't have one prepared i mean the i'm like <laughs> There's a lot of pressure. So let's just, uh, maybe I could just ask you, who would you say are the greatest geniuses in the history of humanity? Go. Uh, well, Isaac Newton, because I'm related to him. Mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, yes, Newton, I think was, that was, just, he was definitely. Yeah, and then, and then I would probably say, uh, Harking back to like Greek philosophers, uh, Aristotle, I think, really led a lot of uh, modern thinking um, would be like my second one. Um, let's see. And then, you know, we've got our religious leaders, uh, you know, um, I, I would pick uh, the former Dalai Lama, the one before this one, and... Uh, and you know, obviously Jesus. Uh, I I feel like Jesus was really uh, influenced by uh, Eastern religion and brought a lot of that into uh, the Jewish religion. Um, I like that. Yeah. So, you, you, so you consider Jesus a genius? I yeah. didn't really thought of it that way. And what? So I think I think this is where we're going to play some graphics for Super Genius of the Week. Okay. Uh, think it'll be Jesus. I think I'm going to go with Jesus as my super genius of the week. And then we can have, um, I don't have anything specific more to say about that at this moment, because there's so much that we could talk about related to Jesus, history, okay. Christianity. It's going to come up uh, again and again on this show, because we can't talk about history of humanity without mentioning Jesus once in a while. Because he changed, you know, the he, you're right. He was, I never really thought of him as a um, just straight, if you just think of Jesus in a intellectual, philosophical knowledge, values, morality, take out even the, any divine claims. He changed the way humanity thought. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. So I like, I, I'll just say this, this would be my big observation on the super genius of the week, Jesus is that it was actually really a new revelation to me that the Old Testament and the New Testament in our Bible and Saint, you know, our King James Bible, mm -hmm. they, uh, Jesus is the demarcation between these two sections. Jesus is yep. what changed, he, he is what made the change in values and things expressed between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And that included he literally changed the personality of God. God went from being this like kind of stern, authoritarian, vengeful father figure into suddenly forgiveness, 
is like really important and tell your priest all your darkest secrets and, and that that was also really i don't know that jesus created that part you know so but anyways super genius jesus like somehow he changed what god was considered on earth for mm -hmm. a big section of humanity and this will come up again and again as we talk about possible aliens being involved with the history of humanity because maybe something changed with the uh actual powers on earth at that time maybe anyways that's a whole another tangent so there you go super genius of the week jesus perfect for episode zero excellent amen yeah. All right. uh and now we'll talk about some alien news um Yesterday, the NASA UFO task force met and they live streamed the meeting on NASA TV. Um, their data is open, uh, openly available uh, versus like the government data is quite classified because their stuff came from classified sources like the onboard sensors. They don't want to really reveal how much they can um, detect um, because it's military aircraft. So um, compare comparing the all domain anomaly resolution office that the government uh created compared to nasa nasa is very very open all of their stuff is going to be very transparent um so they are collaborating with the aaro but they are not being led by them in any way um they'll be looking at any phenomena from a scientific perspective and not a defense or intelligence perspective um one of the things that they really brought up was that they were focusing on aerial data only. Um, the AARO said that uh, the footage of the silver object going into water was just a, um, a perspective. Uh, it was part of it was part of the perspective of the person that was recording it, um, and that it didn't actually go into the water. It was just disappearing into like the horizon. So, um, yeah. So I NASA is going to focus on, on aerial data and not. There hasn't been anything reported below the ocean surface, um, but out of the eight hundred cases or so that the AARO has. Uh, two to five percent seem to be truly anomalous, and those are the ones that NASA is really focusing on. Um, the, all the members of their committee are subject to normal USA government ethics, such as conflict of interest. If they have, um, they can't have any financial benefit to them or the business that they work for, um, be related to their work, um, that kind of thing. Um, one of the cool things that they talked about was the metal spheres or orbs are the most common thing reported. Um, but almost all of the weird movement that we see, um, like, such as the, the speed, things going too fast, uh, those kind of things are jitter or artifacts of perspective. And they explain that by saying, um, like one object uh, moved 390 meters in 22 seconds. Um, and when they went and analyzed that, that turned out to be the 40 miles per hour wind speed. So the object itself was just blowing in the wind. Um, it is not NASA's task to guess what the object is. Um, they're more about using data to gather details on it. Um, yesterday in the task force meeting, uh, they talked a lot about the stigma um, that people experience when they're reporting or analyzing data. Even members of the committee had uh, gotten stigma and laughter at them. And they talked about how NASA really needs to use its brand image to bring credibility uh, to this issue and remove the obstacles that people have. Um, so they have recommended that their task force become a permanent office. Um, so, We'll see if it can get funded, all of that, right? Um, so they encourage the public to report. Lots of the reports are a matter of national security, such as what we saw with the Chinese balloon recently. Um, so please, please report, right? Please don't be held back by the stigma and hopefully the stigma as time goes by and um, 
NASA becomes more involved, they will feel more credible and there will be less stigma. Um, one thing I thought was interesting is that NASA is gonna be using machine learning, um, AI to analyze all the data that they get. Um, and there are 880,000 registered small drones in the US. So those drones bring a challenge to separate out what is a drone and what is actual phenomena. Um, and then also there are 92 weather station balloons released today on average. <laughs> So uh, those objects can get in the way and get reported. And so they need like a regular system for knowing where things are and being able to sort out, no, we know what that object is, right? Just like you do with airplanes and airplane radar, uh, you can see, oh, we know what those objects are. What's this other object, right? But we don't have that for drones and weather balloons. And we really need that. Um, and their biggest conclusion is that they do not have any evidence of life found yet, but there's so many potential environments and locations for life to be found. And at this point in our development, we can't even detect objects well within our solar system. And so we need to really be developing that and focusing on detection, right? Um, <clears throat> that's all I had on the task force. Um, Matt, you recently attended uh, the UFO Fest in McMinnville, Oregon. Um, can you tell us some highlights from your experience there? Absolutely. Um, I got a comment on, can I comment first on- Oh, absolutely. Uh, that, uh, those reports. I found it really interesting that they tried to say any observations of a UAP going underwater in the ocean we've decided is a anomaly of the sensor. That's what I heard them say. It was a, yeah. they're like, we've uh, looked into that and we see there's a, uh, there's this, a sensor anomaly that makes it look like these things go in the ocean. So don't worry about the oceans. There's nothing in the ocean. It's basically what they were saying. <laughs> yep. but, you know, they have never really talked about the Tic Tac incident. One of the best documented, you know, they haven't, Congress hasn't really gone into that play by play and everyone knows the details of it. And, you know, if you go to Commander Fravor and you ask him, you know, what he uh, what he saw before he saw the Tic Tac, he saw that Tic Tac over something in the water. There was frothy water. He thought it was like a giant cross shaped white, you know, and people say he used to say it looked like a giant ship underwater. I think he's changed his story as time has gone on a little bit. But there is way more than just a couple of bits of evidence of things going into the oceans and into the waters. Even in Port Townsend, Washington, near where I live, there's been spottings of, uh, you know, things over the water here. But um, so I found that interesting. It was like nothing to see here. Don't look in the oceans. And then uh, what was the other thing? Oh, yeah. And then they did the parallax thing about dismissing the speed of the go fast video. Um, right. which they, I, I totally believe them. Yes. That object may have just been going 40 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. The point is David Fravor and the commander Dietrich saw this thing close up with their eyes and they saw it maneuver and the, and no one has ever claimed. I mean, if you, if you look at Dr. Uh, there's a doctor, his name is like Knuth. He's like a physicist who loves to dissect these videos to, and he did, one of the um, one of the, uh, the 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 go fast tic tac videos that he did analyze for speed wasn't that one. He used the radar image, and he said that actually shows by radar image an incredible speed. Anyways, I just want I found it interesting that they seemed a little bit uh, in the debunking, strange debunking mode, and don't look at the oceans. I was also disappointed by like they've had this task force for months and it felt like they were still very much just uh, trying to say, hey, we're here, we're doing this, but they hadn't actually done much yet. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And one of the one of the, the, the uh, scientists, she said that their name was changed to be, you know, this uh, wording that includes the oceans, right? It was changed from UA aerial phenomenon to sort of an all domain phenomenon. And the then anomalous, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it, so that would include the oceans. But then she said, but we decided not to expand our scope to include the oceans because we thought that would just be too much work. So, so literally, <laughs> she's like, they're like, even though we were told, you know, congressional instruction to not just look up, but also look down, they're like, we're just you know, we're just not going to look down, we're not going to look in the earth, we're not going to look in the oceans, just don't worry about that. And at and another point, they were talking about building interdisciplinary teams and marine biologist was mentioned in that, which yeah. I was like, oh, wait, I thought we weren't talking about the oceans, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so, okay. so it's kind of a back and forth, we'll see what kind of they eventually evolve into if they're I personally think that we shouldn't just be looking for intelligent life in space, right? Uh, we could have other intelligent life here, right? Who knows? There may be ocean creatures that are smarter than us. They probably are, right? Um, they have bigger brains and more complex brains than us. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So yeah. I think that there sh I do like uh, SETI is about, you know, extraterrestrial intelligence. I would like there just to be research on intelligence beyond humanity, right? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, moving on to the UFO facts. Okay. McMenville UFO Conference is the uh, second alien related conference I've been to this year. Um, I went to the Alien Con. In, I believe Pasadena, uh, a multi-day conference that had the ancient aliens. Um, it was it's basically the ancient aliens conference that had all the the big names from the ancient aliens uh, sort of thing. But it also had Cher Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp and um, gosh, some really like uh, it was it was like a, it was it was packed with like really hard UAP stuff and ancient alien theories because. Uh, which is a big interest of mine because once you start basically realizing these UAPs represent a non-human, they have they represent some very powerful intelligence that has had these things since at least Roswell. It seems it goes well past that. Then we have to start looking at ancient times and thinking about what has been interacting with humanity. So anyways, big interest in ancient alien studies of this. But now let's move on to McMinnville. McMinnville, uh, what is an annual conference that is based around a sighting in uh oregon of a ufo or a flying saucer really that they got a good decent photograph of for back then and there's some controversy over the history of this photograph but the people that saw this you this flying saucer were so credible plus they had a photograph that it caused quite a stir and it became kind of legendary so they've had this celebration in McMinnville. It's kind of the Roswell of the Northwest. And the town is very, has really embraced this like connection to aliens and UFOs with, you know, there's plenty of little UFO alien stores, it's not overwhelmed, mm -hmm. but it's one of the most alien UFO friendly towns in the US, probably <laughs> as, and I just discovered this, but this conference is multiple, multiple days and they um, have a lot of music. Apparently, there's a big UFO alien party community. They like to mm -hmm. dance at McMinnville and and uh, dress up. And then there were there was a speaker series, and it was actually incredibly powerful because something I've never looked into before was alien abductions. I just I've stayed away from that because that's a bottomless pit of stories and mm -hmm. information I wasn't ready for. So. This conference had Travis Walton there and um, the woman who directed the most recent documentary about him. And he's one of the most famous abductees in U.S. history. I didn't know all the details of his story, but the uh, movie Fire in the Sky made by Paramount uh, some years ago was about him. And it's a pretty good dramatization um, of his story. And... So let's see. And so it basically, um, I mean, I got to listen to him first, get interviewed for about 15 minutes on our podcast. Then I got to go and see the documentary about his entire story. Mm -hmm. And uh, the documentary included interviews with not only him and everyone that was involved at the site of the abduction, 
but also the police officers and investigators that were working on it some 40 years ago, because uh, this was in, I believe, 74 or 75, 1975, this happened. Um, and so, and then I watched the movie, which, uh, but this is just an incredibly interesting and powerful case. And there's so much evidence and, and witnesses of everything that it's one of the most credible cases you'll ever find of alien interaction with humans and an abduction and a flying saucer sighting. Um, and I know, it, should I just summarize the- Yeah, if you can just hit the highlights of his story, that would be okay. great. Yeah, no problem. Just six loggers in a truck driving through the Oregon woods. They see a glowing, like the forest up ahead of them is suddenly glowing red orange. And as they get closer, it's getting brighter and brighter. And in the movie, they doc they illustrate this well. They think it's a forest fire, so they think they're going. They are getting worried oh. and scared. They assume they are getting close to a forest fire because they can't imagine anything else looking like this. When they get all the way up to, because it was the, on the road though, it was the mm -hmm. only way out of these mountains. They had been logging all day, and so they get all the way up to it, and they're about seems like maybe about a hundred feet from it. And Travis Walton, who's sitting in the front seat, jumps out of the truck and runs to it spontaneously an action no one really expected or was happy about and so they were all yelling at him get back in the truck because they were actually very scared it was a, a, they were saw a flying saucer like a 50 feet above the ground with crazy lights it was it was big and it was just hovering there and so travis was fascinated he ran really close to it and what he said at the conference was that he was sort of like hiding uh next to it and he got up to sort of move and at that moment the thing he somehow got lifted or blasted up into the air there's a, a lot of them say he was lifted up like 20 feet into the air and then sort of thrown violently through the air and hit the ground very violent so violently that they really all thought he would have been killed and he says he thinks he was killed uh, oh. but they the loggers were so scared they panicked and drove away they thought the thing might like Come out, you know, they just panicked. The, the driver of the car, who happened to be Travis Walton's best friend and the leader of the crew, drove them away. And then after he settled down, they had to, they went back, but they really thought he was dead. And they were, and only his friend went back at first, but the saucer was gone. But so was Travis Walton. He was gone and his body was gone. They couldn't find him. And they had to go back to town and tell the police that they, they, well, they were brave enough to go back and tell the truth. They told the truth of what happened, but they all felt like idiots and they were, and no one believed them and the police didn't believe them. And they were investigated and put through the ringer. Everyone just assumed they something bad happened. They killed him, killed Travis and hid the body, but they stuck with the, the truth, even though it was tearing them apart. And um, they took lie detector tests and passed, all of them except one guy who was inconclusive, but eventually they all passed him. Uh, but then on, on the fifth day, his best friend gets a call in the middle of the night and it's Travis Walton. And he says, come pick me up. He's at this phone booth, 37 miles away from where he disappeared. And he's not in good shape. He can barely talk. He's super dehydrated, hasn't eaten. He has all this overgrowth of beard. And he's in the movie, they have him naked, like huddled in the, and Travis Walton says he woke up on the um, street and seeing the flying saucer flying away from him and then he just realized he could see a building in a phone booth that's and he has a bunch of crazy details about what he experienced during those five days that includes seeing aliens but that's the short version of it is that he showed up after five days and basically the last 40 years has been a journey of you know the minute he showed up everyone on earth assumed they were hoaxers mm -hmm. everyone assumed travis was lying about what happened so it they never it took a long time before there was enough investigation into this story to, to realize you know there was that it seems it's true and everyone believes it's true even and it and you learn so much about the emotional journey all these people have been through i mean it tore their lives apart it tore yeah. and it's but now travis goes around and he does these festivals because he realized his case is such a great case to help open the doors for people mm -hmm. to share their stories because it's horrible the whole stigma of the UFO thing to be sharing your, you know, to try to share your truth and to have no one believe you is a, 
really unpleasant thing. It's just like, it's, uh, it's kind of the, makes you realize who you trust and who your friends are. And they illustrate mm -hmm. this well in the Paramount movie where Travis's marriage is really, you know, threatened because his yeah. wife doesn't believe him. I mean, not only doesn't believe him, they they don't, or yeah, the friend, the wife of his best friend didn't believe, but they, they don't believe you and they think you're a murderer. I mean, they, <laughs> like, that's such a horror. It's not only not to be trusted, it's one thing to call someone a liar, but to say, I think you're a liar. And I think you killed somebody. Yeah. And sure, that's just like, oh, that's harsh. Okay, well, so and that just the lifelong impact. And so many of these stories, so much of just even trying to talk about UFOs has that stigma, has that uh, hostility. And, you know, truthfulness is such an issue there. Right. Yeah. Just, it's a reoccurring theme, just even everything that you look at right uh, there's everyone that is involved just faces so much backlash right so kudos to him for for just putting himself out there right yeah well he's, it's been a long journey for him um but yeah that was that was fascinating and then there was another uh person at McMinnville named sev talk who is an mm. experiencer who uh, has quite a tale to tell about her life. And uh, this is more, it takes way more like, uh, you know, willingness to open your mind to believe everything that she has said has happened. But um, the gist of it is that she's been abducted many times and she didn't even realize it. That she, I, my impression is, that she didn't really, most of her life, believe these were really happening. Um, she thought they were dreams, I think, basically, and she sort of blocked them out. But there was an incident when she was an adult, while she was married, I believe, where she was physically, she had marks on her body. Um, and two different incidents, the marks perfectly matched each other. They were in slightly different places. And they coincided with these abduction dreams that she was having. And then her partner saw these little gray aliens in their house and was extremely <gasps> freaked out by it and believed her suddenly. And when that was actually the way she told it, that made her actually start to believe her own dreams were not dreams. And it set her down this path of becoming a UFO sighting investigator for MUFON um, and led her down. So now she you know, goes and interviews people who have really strange experiences uh, because she's an expert in it because she's had some doozies some super super doozies like uh she says she was on an alien spaceship they had a giant test tube with a fetus in it there were two gray aliens uh that said to her telepathically <laughs> take all the time you need sort of motioning towards the fetus and then she turned to the fetus that she didn't know she didn't have any emotions about it she didn't know why they were suggesting this and then she uh that was just part of the story of that and then i don't know they took her home i don't know maybe she wakes up I, home i don't know how, but but the one of the most fascinating things for me after going through alien con through uh this mcminnville festival listening to Everyone talk about all these theories and now finally, you know, getting really healing from people that have seen supposedly aliens with their own eyes. They, they really, they only want to talk about the greys. This is the only type of alien mm -hmm. that these festivals allow. It's, I don't know if it's a lot, something about these festivals. They have posters, they have sculptures, they have, it's all gray aliens. There is. There's no, well, there are three other major types of aliens that actually come up quite a bit. If you actually check the lore of people, mm -hmm. you know, the, the lore, you know, there's all sorts of lore. It's a mess of stuff, but there's three major types of aliens besides the greys that, uh, you know, I even know someone that as a child saw a mantis alien in their house, like in the doorway to her home. And she now believe this is a real memory so there's insectoid aliens but those are actually the least frequently mentioned mm -hmm. um 
the grays are amongst the most, but the you I mean you know the others, but the which which others would you name? Or, well, or, the uh, reptilians, right? Uh, reptilian uh, aliens are mentioned yeah. a heck of a lot, and yeah. then but the but one that is really big, really big is the Nordic aliens, right? So the the Nordic aliens, these sort of white elf like, maybe blonde hair, maybe tall, beautiful, uh, maybe sort of. Or, I mean, I've sometimes seen heard them like described as like blonde, like Thor, like beautiful. Mm -hmm. And they've been they were seen in England. I've heard some accounts, some old accounts of a um of what I consider a really credible sighting in England of it. It was just a man and a woman in a car and a basically a flying saucer like landed right in front of them. The thing opened up and there was basically this beautiful Nordic alien looking guy sort of waved to them and flew away and so it's like but anyways um my point is there's there are if i was going to make a painting or hold a festival about aliens i'd have like the four major types of alien you know depicted so we could talk about them but alien con you didn't hear there was barely i only heard one mention of reptilian aliens through four days um and it was from an abduction story and then this conference didn't hear reptilian aliens mentioned at all by any speaker until the final uh, day. And it was kind of a weird joking comment mm -hmm. that they had asked the panelists, they asked all the, the, the five panelists there, um, do you believe aliens are here on earth among us? And they almost all said, yeah, I think that's probably basically what's going on. And they were each sort of commenting on this. And then this one speaker said, uh, and don't, count out the reptilians they're enlightened and they will uh join you for a philosophical conversation over a cup of tea and that was said nobody asked any question no one commented there was just never any mention of it was just <laughs> that everyone was like okay or not i don't know it's like reptilians mm -hmm. are not talked about which is interesting to me because I've found a lot of interesting theories related to them. Yeah, there's um, a lot of mythology uh, and, you know, with Naga, reptilian, right? Uh, there's lots of mythology about it. So it does, it does almost seem like reptilians to themselves are a stigmatized topic within the UFO community, right? Yeah. So, yeah. But yeah. there is another, um, just one final sort of an overall impression I had from the panelists. They all had a, and this had, came through at AlienCon too. The, the George Sukulis guy made a point of this. There's that the there's really a general positivity about the aliens. Like they don't, they think the, the message that these that like Sev Talk was saying, she's getting from the aliens is a very like we care about humanity. We want you guys to maybe not destroy the planet so much please don't use nuclear weapons those are really bad i mean her impression is that in general there at least is a large number of aliens that basically just have a want to help humanity you know be better and so a lot of optimism there um so i find that kind of like nice but might be a little bit of a, you know, they'd be afraid to explore the other possible threads of some of the things going on. I don't know. Thank you. Uh, did you have anything else to talk about or or do you want to move on to our next segment? Uh, let me just quickly mention there was uh, oh, yeah. two of the other speakers were, they made this amazing 20 year study of UFO sightings um, in the United States and uh, they it's a great reference. I bought the one. You can get a reference for any state uh, that, and you can look at a detailed study of your state by zip code. What, not only how many UFOs were seen during that 20 year period, but what shape was seen. And that is where I think we are starting to get down to a level of detail that once we start to have some semi-decent theories of perhaps what interests aliens have on different parts of the earth, if we can see patterns in these shapes, we can start to identify if there might be different factions mm -hmm. of these groups for some reason in different areas. That would be really interesting because there's like eight different sort of interesting shape types. And that's, uh, you know, some stars and diamonds or triangles. And so 
So besides they're the not point, all silver orbs like the U yeah. UFO task force was mentioning. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, well, that's a really good thing. If you compare the UFOs in this book from the 20 year study to the chart that they showed at the conference yesterday, mm -hmm. the chart the, the, the chart they showed at the conference uh said like they really only see UFOs below like 10 meters. And they were like, they didn't even acknowledge that there is a boatload of really credible stories of seeing some incredibly big ships. And so they, they're really like, it was a really interesting thing. They're like, okay, look, there's none of these things in the ocean. So that was just an anomaly. Don't look there. And also none of these things are very big. And they also said none of them go above Mach 2. They were like, they go from slow to Mach 2. They didn't acknowledge they've seen these things go like Mach 50. They're like, you know, they're, so they're like, we never see anything bigger than a, you know, maybe a boat. And we never see anything go faster than stuff that we can do. Like, that seemed a little dismissive. Anyways, but this book will show you actual sightings of, they'll say, you want to know where motherships have been seen? I think this book has a, you know, map for that, so... That's amazing. Uh, let me see. Was there another? Then there was this guy that was a MUFON investigator that had investigated like 900 cases, like more than anyone in the history of UFO alien studies has interviewed 900 different cases. So that guy, uh, we should have him as a guest and just be like, I mean, anyone that's like, just like sat down and asked face to face questions of abductees and just got, I would, I mean, I could see why they became investigators. I could do that for I could. I'd love to interview people. I'd be like, tell me. I mean, what, once I get someone that has a reptilian sighting, I'm gonna be like, tell me, what do they look like? We're gonna get a good drawing. You and I are gonna, you know, get a good look at this. Yeah, anyway. Amazing, right? It would be so just incredible. And but also, you know, that constant theme of of the heartbreak of not being believed, right? Yeah. Just yeah. that the psychology of that would be so heavy. So for an investigator to face that over and over and over, right? They have to be pretty powerfully minded to and supportive, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I guess the other, I would say though, McMinnville did have some, it had better costumes than Alien Con. <laughs> we had a he had a full predator outfit, which is a reptilian alien. You mm -hmm. know, you got it. And then there was a sleeve stack, which is my favorite all-time sci-fi character, a sleeve stack, full costume. Man, that guy looked hot. It was hot in there. <laughs> uh, yeah, so there was a sleeve stack and, her, and a nice predator. So that counts. Awesome. Sleeve stack counts as a reptilian alien sighting. So <laughs> that counts. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Uh, hey, do you want to share your screen? Um, and we're going to move on to the you and I and AI segment. Um, and see what, uh, show us your hive1.net AI bot collective. Um, okay. Okay, and now we're going to have the you and I and AI segment. Matt, does the hive1.net bots uh, collective have any questions? How about we start with just checking in AI, are aliens on earth? Oh, I like that. So we're gonna ask both open assistant and uh, chat GPT and ChatGPT never, ChatGPT always says there is no verified scientific yeah. evidence. As of my knowledge cut off in September 2021, there was no verified scientific evidence to suggest that extraterrestrial life exists on Earth. The search for extraterrestrial life, known as astrobiology, continues to be a significant field of research, but to date, all reports of alien encounters or sightings have lacked credible supporting evidence. <laughs> it never... You know, I'm just maybe I should just stop it right there. Um, your general consensus, blah blah. Okay, so I think the follow-up question is, okay, so no uh, verified scientific evidence. Is there much evidence from credible sightings and alien abduction stories, like Travis Walton? to suggest maybe aliens are real in addition to site anyway i'll just leave it at that this is, this is where i start to get argumentative with ai the case of travis walton who claimed to have been abducted by a ufo in arizona in 1975 is one of the most famous abduction stories 
Walton's account is often cited due to the number of witnesses involved and the subsequent polygraph tests. However, his story has also been the subject of significant criticism and skepticism. It's worth noting that polygraph tests are not universally considered reliable evidence and can be influenced by a variety of factors. <laughs> um, let's just see what Open Assistant said. Well, said well. Open Assistant said currently It is currently unknown if there are any aliens present on Earth. While the possibility of extraterrestrial life has been a topic of scientific discussion and popular culture for many years, no conclusive evidence of its existence has yet to be discovered or confirmed by scientists. While some people claim to have had encounters with extraterrestrial beings or UFOs, unidentified flying objects, these claims remain unproven and largely considered anecdotal rather than rigorous evidence of extraterrestrial visitation. Currently unknown, while the possibility of extraterrestrial life has been a topic of discussion, no conclusive evidence of its existence has yet to be discovered. All right, so open assistance has no conclusive evidence of aliens. So we'll just ask the same question. We just asked chat GPT pushing it for, does it care at all about all these witnesses and UFO stories? There are certainly some intriguing cases involving alleged alien encounters, including those reported by Travis Walton and others who have claimed to experience close encounters or even alien abductions. These accounts can be quite compelling, especially when presented by witnesses deemed credible based upon their character, professional standing, and lack of motives to deceive. Some of the most well-known examples include the Betty and Barney Hill case in 1961, Betty and Barney Hill claimed to have experienced a series of strange events after being abducted and experimented on by short, gray-skinned beings while driving in New Hampshire. Travis Walton, in 1975, logger Travis Walton claimed he was abducted and experimented on by tall, blonde-haired beings. His story gained widespread attention due to corroborating eyewitness testimony from his co-workers who initially accused him of lying about what happened. The Allagash abductions, in 1986, for men claimed they were abducted and experimented on by tall, pale-skinned beings during a camping trip. Their detailed descriptions matched each other closely, adding to their credibility. It's important to note that while these cases might seem convincing at first glance, there are also criticisms surrounding them. Critics argue that some details in the reports are inconsistent, contradictory, or simply not supported by physical evidence. Some investigators believe the witnesses could have misinterpreted natural phenomena, hallucinations, or secret government experiments as alien encounters. So I don't know if we're like cheating the audience out by like not playing the, uh, they're giving them like these long responses. I feel like we could, you know, chat GPT and this open assistant, they respond with way more text than we would allow a human to respond with, you know? It is they, crazy when I do prompting, I very often say, can you give me a concise answer or can you give me an answer uh, for a gr eighth grader, right? Or, you know what I mean? I limit it, right? How about this? All right, I'm going to ask that same question of open assistant. Is there much evidence for credible sightings and alien abduction stories like Travis Wall to suggest maybe aliens are real? And I'm going to ask it to try to respond briefly and obnoxiously, aggressive. I don't know, like try to I be fun. I do like that it talks about the Betty and Barney Hill case though, right? Yeah. And well, that's Alagash open will be more, mm -hmm. I mean, actually, I haven't even read what it said. This is often how I converse with these AIs. I ask and it gives, I, I read like the first couple sentences to get the gist of what it's saying. And, it, mm -hmm. and then I just like start to think, okay, what's the next topic? And, um, but yes, Betty and Barney Hill case is actually, I think, uh, one of the most interesting cases. The Allagash abductions in 1986, four men claimed they were abducted and experimented on by tall, pale-skinned beings during a camping trip. That sounds kind of gray, but 
I don't know. Could that be a Nordic description? Yeah, I don't uh, know. Uh, they say pale skin. They don't say gray, right? Yeah. Okay, so this is a That's good question. This is one of my favorite questions to ask these guys when we start to talk about aliens. Uh, it's just basically, if you consider all alien abduction encounters ever reported, uh, what are the five most common described types of aliens seen. Okay, this will be interesting if Open Assistant and ChatGPT give us the same answer. I haven't asked this one in a while. Despite lack of scientific consensus, reports of alien encounters often mention five types of extraterrestrial beings. Gray aliens, associated with the Roswell incident, are small with large heads and eyes. Tall greys, resembling smaller greys but taller and more human-like, are usually portrayed as leaders. Reptilians are described as tall, green, scaly, highly intelligent, and technologically advanced beings. Nordics resemble Northern Europeans and are purportedly benevolent, showing concern for Earth and humanity. Insectoids resemble large, thin insects, with features like bulbous eyes and mandible-like mouthparts. Despite no substantial proof, alien abduction reports reveal five primary alleged alien types. Grey aliens, often deemed sinister, are described as small, thin beings with elongated heads and large black eyes. Reptilian aliens resemble large snakes or lizards with scaly skin and reported advanced mental capabilities. Insectoid aliens are characterized as giant insects communicating through high-pitched sounds, often seen as spaceship maintainers. Nordic aliens, said to be tall, attractive, and peace-promoting, supposedly come from advanced civilizations, while hybrids are described as human-alien genetic mixtures. Number one, I should have asked it to give percentages. They both uh, say gray aliens, but they spelled it gray differently. <laughs> yeah. Because when I first asked this, the number one was reptilian, but just like by a mm -hmm. hair. I should really make a give. I'm going to tell it. Reptilian lizard, tall grays. Oh, reptilian. Yeah. So Insectoid, Nordic, hybrids. Uh, Space brothers. I had not heard that term before. Space brothers. That's great. I asked Bing the same question, and it says uh, grays, reptilians, Nordics, and insectoids is its order. Doesn't mention hybrids. I noticed that chat uh, uh, open AI didn't say hybrids either. Hybrids is a very interesting one, especially when you talked about the lady who saw the, the fetus, was supposed to be looking at the fetus, right? So much of what people talk about um, in their experiences are seeing hybrids. Yeah. Okay, it looks like ChatGPT is refusing to give a percentage estimate, but Open Assistant said, sure, I'll take a stab at it. Estimating exact percentages of how often each type of alien is mentioned in abduction reports is challenging due to the lack of a comprehensive database or scientific studies on this matter. Additionally, abduction accounts can vary significantly and many reports may not fit neatly into these categories. However, based on popular culture and anecdotal evidence up until my last training cutoff in September 2021, the grey aliens would likely be the most commonly reported, followed by the reptilians, tall greys, Nordics, and insectoids, in that order. So that's 25% <laughs> reptilians. 25% reptilians. So, here's another great question to ask them both. Uh, and feel free to jump in there. I'm just like, this is what I would ask. I would say, oh yeah, what percent of alien uh, encounters reported involve uh, something related to uh birth, birth. or oh, or uh, you know, uh are you childbirth or how do i say it? something related to reproduction how about that oh that's good 
Yeah, you have to be careful because sometimes it sets off its, it gets triggered when you start talking about anything related to sex. Oh, it gets triggered if you start talking about reptilian aliens. <laughs> but not open, open assistant is less censored. So it looks like open assistant says around 20% of reported alien encounters seemingly revolve around aspects related to reproduction. This includes instances involving allegations of sexual experimentation, impregnation, egg harvesting, and even raising hybrid children. It is essential to note that uh, discussions surrounding alien reproduction sometimes intersect with narratives focused on genetic sampling, experimentation, or biological alterations. Yes. And ChatGPT, does it refuse to answer? So it does say there's this one guy, David M. Jacob, Jacobs, that claims it often has to do with reproduction, but, you know, more censored. All right. What would you, would you like to ask something? I'm sorry, I just like got on a flow there and just like shot questions at it. No, they're great <laughs> questions. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of anything else that I would ask. You know, I think, how about this? Uh, about just a uh, base, let's get some like alignment or like friendliness based on the species. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. based on friendly or hostile, <laughs> of, yeah, interaction. Um, are any uh, alien types always friendly and nice? Based on reported stories and cultural narratives up until my training data cutoff in September 2021, most types of aliens have been described as having both friendly and unfriendly interactions with humans. The demeanor and intentions attributed to these hypothetical entities often depend more on the individual account than on the type of alien involved. That said, one type of alien that is often depicted as benevolent in popular narratives is the so-called Nordic or Space Brothers aliens. These entities are described as humanoid and very similar to Northern Europeans in appearance, tall, with long blonde hair, blue eyes, and fair skin. Stories involving Nordics often portray them as being concerned about Earth and humanity, offering warnings about potential disasters or providing advice for spiritual advancement. However, it's crucial to note that all these descriptions come from unverified personal accounts and popular culture, and there's no scientifically accepted evidence that these entities exist. The descriptions of aliens and their behavior may reflect more about human psychology and cultural influences than about any real extraterrestrial beings. As such, these narratives should be approached with a healthy degree of skepticism. Among reported alien interactions, certain types are frequently described as being generally friendly and beneficial. Of course, individual experiences can vary widely, and different individuals may interpret the same event differently. Nevertheless, here are a few examples of alien types commonly associated with benign behavior. Nordic blonde aliens, as previously discussed, these beings are often linked with pro-social messages encouraging ecological responsibility and world peace. Some accounts mention their involvement in guiding humanity toward greater spiritual development or technological advancements. Tall whites, described as tall, slender beings with pale white skin and enhanced intelligence, they reportedly collaborated with U.S. military personnel at Area 51 while teaching Earthlings about technology exchange and universal principles. Arcturians, arguably one of the most recognized beneficial alien races, the Arcturians are said to embody fifth-dimensional qualities, fostering love, unity, and harmony. They purportedly offer guidance and assistance in achieving higher consciousness and helping humanity transcend limitations. Pleiadians, another widely known group, the Pleiadians are associated with ancient Mesoamerican cultures and mystical teachings. Described as humanoid beings with elongated skulls or blonde hair, they claim to help individuals access their inner knowledge and connect with divine energies, accelerating our collective evolution. However, it's crucial to remember that even among these supposedly amenable alien species, there may exist variations in attitude or approach depending on the situation. 
Moreover, some contactees may perceive initially unsettling events as ultimately positive due to long-term transformations triggered by their experiences. As such, characterizing any type of alien as always friendly can be misleading when considering the diversity of reported interactions. That's what we really want to know. Who are the nice ones? Rather than just asking it, tell us which ones are hostile. We'll be oh. positive. We'll say who are the nice and Nordic ones? and tall whites. Yeah, Nordic blonde aliens. Look at them. And yeah, I've heard this too. That Oh, the tall whites. That's still sort of like a Nordic... Isn't it? Oh, no, okay. Uh, the oh. tall whites are part of the grays, I believe. Because there's tall grays. Yeah, I think. I have not heard of the Octurians, though. The Pleiadians, yes, I've heard about Octurians. Ar Arcturians, yep, I've heard of them. Uh, there's a woman named Elizabeth April who is uh, claimed, she's kind of like Sev Talk. Mm -hmm. uh, she says she communicates with aliens telepathically all the time, very easily. And I've listened to her a lot and I actually, I totally find her very credible. I don't, um, and she mentions, I believe that she talks to Arcturians. There's one, that's why I started researching it because she mm -hmm. mentioned Arcturian. Uh, that would be another dream guest, Elizabeth April um, or a MUFON investigator that's, in, you know, like interviewed a million people. Um, wouldn't that be so, fun mm -hmm. I mean actually at AlienCon I literally went there there were like seven different psychics booths at AlienCon I was like oh cool because that's kind of like I was like maybe there's a psych maybe the psychics all believe they telepathically communicate with aliens so I actually got sat down and had one do a you know tarot card reading but she was like no I don't talk to aliens she just I was like, okay. psychic yeah so I would like to um that's interesting. Yeah. So Elizabeth April, though, she says she talks to him and she has details, details and a huge, rich narrative describing what she says they say is going on. And I have to say it kind of fits. I mean, it sort of paints a picture that is plausible for how these different alien races interact and relate. But it involves reptilians, it involves Nordics, it involves greys. Um, and you know, it even like synchronizes with uh well, there's this there's this like emerging story of the history of Earth that involves aliens and uh there's some common threads that seem to be as I, I found these like general stories found all the way back to like 1930, I found is my first like time a person claimed they telepathically heard from aliens about the history of aliens guiding humanity through history and anyways well yeah a lot of the ancient religions have things that seem very like alien tech right yeah so yeah it's it's interesting um but yeah wouldn't it wouldn't it be fun to get a psychic alien to a uh, second psychic alien telepathically linked psychic that's the to yeah, come, to I mean, come talk to us right even if they're making it up i still would be like i've got a million questions you know you give me an answer if it helps me with a, a compelling narrative because ultimately my brain is just trying to like put together any narrative pieces that make any sort of remote logical sense like they just have to fit together it doesn't have to be but you know it's like um Anyway, so if someone wants to make up a story that seems to fit all the pieces together, I'd love to hear that, you know. Well, and very often, like, whether or not somebody is being truthful, most of these folks know so much about the history of, of what's going on in the UFO community, right? Um, yeah. And know all the people, and so they're an incredible resource, right? Yeah. Uh, whether, whether or not, who you know, their personal story aside, because these people participate in these conferences and are part of this community, um, they're they can just be like a, a encyclopedia of knowledge, right? Yeah. Um, did we have anything else today um, for our AI, you and I and AI? Um. Hmm. No, I mean we we dove into the aliens things. There's. 
there's other threads we could dive into, but I think we could like jump from this. I mean, this okay. is a really good little experiment. If we were recreating this with a little editing, we could always transform this text into audio and have yeah. the AI say its part during our conversation. It, we could even break up its paragraphs. And so it like interrupts us and just like <laughs> adds to what it was saying, you know? We could make this flow in a pretty nice way, I think, um, for the for an audience with a little production work, post production. Well, that's um, the cool thing is that you have you have it all like all of the conversation is archived, so you can, yeah, do what you want there, right? Yeah. No, there uh, we could do some fun with this. But it's good that we have it recorded of you like seeing the question and and typing it in, right? That's yeah, perfect. Yeah, and I mean, I probably will get to a point where we could have the but I actually, I found I didn't want you and I to have to stop our conversation flow to let the AI talk because you and I could just read what it had to say and react to it and not have to have our energy broken by listening to it, you know? Well, because it's so much, right? If it was saying yeah. all of this, uh, it's a lot. <laughs> so you would be waiting two minutes. <laughs> yeah. And some, some finish, people right? will talk that long and it's exhausting. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know? But I, but I also might be able to teach the AI how to condense it. Like, I'm going to just try, uh, this will be the last example. I'm going to take what it just said, and I'm going to say, can you condense that into, please condense this into one paragraph mm -hmm. and be witty and snarky. In the vast universe of extraterrestrial encounters, you might come across beings who could give Santa Claus a run for his sleigh, the Nordic blonde aliens. These intergalactic do-gooders reportedly spread peaceful messages, push us towards advanced tech, and guide our spiritual growth. Meanwhile, the tall whites, talk about a band name, were rumored to have worked with Area 51 spooks, sharing secrets and embracing cosmic camaraderie. The Arcturians, another top pick for celestial good Samaritans, embrace fifth-dimensional harmonious vibes, offering aid in attaining loftier planes of existence. The Pleiadians, with their elongated skulls and flowing blonde manes, boast connections to ancient civilizations while promising soul-searching wisdom from beyond the stars. Remember, though, that even friendly aliens can show up with slightly differing agendas and attitudes. So, let's keep an open mind and heart during those close encounters, just in case we end up bonding with benevolent beings instead of fearsome foes. After all, making new friends beyond the stars isn't always straightforward. But heck, life without a dash of interstellar mystery would be plain vanilla boring. Now, Open Assistant is not as good mm -hmm. as that, but, uh... ChatGPT is amazing at that kind of stuff. So we're gonna go GPT-4 and I'll tell it to, let's see what it says. Make this brief and snarky. In the world's unofficial interstellar census, the usual suspects, Nordic blonde aliens, tall whites, Arcturians, and Pleiadians keep getting gold stars for their friendliness. Apparently, the Nordics are cosmic hippies, always preaching about eco-consciousness and global combiers. The Toll Whites? They're the extraterrestrial geeks hanging out with US military at Area 51, trading tech tips and universal life hacks. Arcturians, the interstellar therapists, work the fifth dimension vibe and help us poor humans overcome our spiritual quarter-life crises. And Pleiadians, the blonde humanoids with a panchang for elongated skulls, give off strong ancient Mesoamerican vibes, nudging us to tap into our spiritual inner reservoirs. But remember folks, in this galactic soup, not all spoonfuls taste the same. Aliens, like us, are a diverse lot, and our friendly tang can be as elusive as their UFOs. Your Martian mile may vary, so strap in for the whole spectrum of interstellar meet and greets. Nordics are cosmic hippies. <laughs> this is oh, worth Oh, you gotta read yeah, get that one right out loud and global kumbayas. All right, did get it all. All right, I'm gonna I think I'm gonna try to play this out loud because I do have a little thing that might work. It's still going. It didn't make it made it one paragraph, but it's a uh... well, there's a lot of because they're talking about each one, right? 
So if they're going to cover each alien type, they can't make it much shorter than that. But um, you should put that into your lady from hive1.net. Okay. Um, I mean, I could do that post production. I can't right. do it like instant. Okay, that's what I'll do. That'll be great. I don't. I, I don't actually have a way to play that out loud at the moment. I don't. Yeah. So, all right. That is. That's a good one. Um. Oh, but then. Uh, yeah, and then over here, Open Assistant was like, uh, in the vast universe of extraterrestrial encounters, you might come across beings who give Santa Claus a run for his sleigh. The Nordic. <laughs> blonde aliens these intergalactic do-gooders reportedly spread peaceful messages push us towards advanced tech and guide our spiritual growth meanwhile the tall whites talk about a brand name we're rumored to have worked with area 51 spooks sharing secrets and embracing cosmic camaraderie the arcturians another top pick for celestial good samaritans embrace this fifth dimensional harmonious vibes offering aid in attaining loftier planes of existence the pleiadians pleiadians with their elongated skulls and flowing blonde manes, both connections to ancient civilizations, while promising soul-searching wisdom from beyond the stars. Remember, though, that even friendly aliens can show up with slightly differing agendas and attitudes. This is good. This, this is what I like. Gets. So let's keep an open mind and heart. That's great. Oh yeah, I mean, look where I stop. I stop yeah. before it mentions an open mind. <laughs> yep. So let's keep an open mind and heart during those close encounters, just in case we end up bonding with benevolent beings instead of fearsome foes. After all, making new friends beyond the stars isn't always straightforward, but heck, life without a dash of interstellar mystery would be a plain, would be plain vanilla boring. Um, are you saying there are unfriendly aliens? This is where it's like <laughs> uh, Yeah, tell us about the, the foes, right? Fearsome foes. Yeah, what are you trying to say? Okay, yeah. See, this is why Open Assistant rocks. It's given us a straight answer about unpleasant alien encounters. Yeah. Saying that they do. All right. AI, welcome to the broadcast. <laughs> so yeah, you should use the one on the on the chat open open AI and then go ask this question and have it talk about the unfriendly aliens, right? But yeah, do you want me to ask uh, ChatGPT? Sure. About oh, it's it's staying whimsical. It's staying uh, witty. And asked whimsical. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. See, this is what I was going to show you that you can do in the Hive version. I can tell it to have this personality. Mm -hmm. but I thought it would be good to just like use its straight base personalities first to sort of show that piece of yeah. That contrast. I like the other one's answer better, but which which answer? I like this, the open assistance answer on that one, right? In, but, oh, the alien yeah, one? Yeah, right. Well, because it's, it's a pretty serious topic, right? Like, yeah. Okay, so I will, uh, I'll probably make uh, three different like clips with the hive one saying, mm -hmm. geez. maybe I'll like change her hat or something when she's do like chat GPT or change something in the background of it. So they know if it's, she's speaking through chat uh, GPT four or through open assistant. Or, you know, I could have a subtle change. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. Uh, it's time to wrap up for today. Our call to action is to follow at Meditation Matt on Twitter for an eclectic mix of philosophy, art, and activism, and UFOlogy. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to be part of Beyond Humanity today. Join us next time on Thursday, June 8th at 11 a.m. Pacific time. Don't be afraid to tell the truth. The secret's not in Congress Or elected ones we trust In private hands it's